So, hello again. We now want to talk about whether love is an emotion. This is surprising, probably, to most of you, because this is the, the only thing we seem to know about love, you know, from our everyday experience of it. Of course, it is an emotion. But you will see that, as it often is in philosophy, it will turn out that, of course, it is not an emotion. And whatever you thought previously probably was wrong. Um, so this is what we will do today. We will briefly talk about whether love is an emotion. I hope to to be able to keep this a little shorter. Um, but let's first see what an emotion is, right? So as always here at the beginning, you have the readings. These three papers we will discuss. You can find those um, on the internet if you if you don't have them, uh, and. Our discussion will be based on those. Okay, so Smuts begins Normative Reasons for Love is the name of the paper. Here it is, right? And he begins by saying what are emotions and we will see later other theories of what emotions are. But Smuts says that the cognitive theory of emotions is something he wants to examine. And the cognitive theory of emotions holds that emotions are object-directed attitudes that involve evaluations. This is a, these are all important words there. Object directed means they're directed towards something that is outside of myself. When I fear something, I fear that thing. And it involves evaluations. My fear involves an evaluation that that thing is dangerous. Right? So we can always say X has the emotion E that F where X is a person, E is an emotion, and F is a fact. X emotion, E, is directed towards a fact, fact, F. I am afraid that this disease will kill my tomato plants. Jack is angry that Jill left the bucket on the hill. So we are always afraid that, angry that, some fact, F. And this is what makes, what defines an emotion. If there is no such external um, evaluation, if there is no such object directedness, then it's not an emotion. Then it is perhaps a mood. <clears throat> Emotions are always about something, they have an object, while moods do not take specific objects. My brother is grumpy today. I feel depressed today. My roommate is aggressive. These are examples of moods that are not emotions because they are not object directed. Now Smuts gives three reasons why love is not an emotion. And the first reason is love is not episodic like fear. What does episodic mean? An episode is a thing that in time is limited. It, it is there and then it's not there like a, a TV episode, right? It's, it's a movie on TV that plays for a while and then it's over. Um, but in general in life an episode is an event that comes and goes <clears throat> in response to some particular external condition. <coughs> so, for example, my fear of spiders is activated when I actually see a spider. <clears throat> There's the external condition, and the, the spider, spider triggers my fear. Now I'm afraid of the spider. I'm in an episode of fear. And when the spider walks on and goes away, my fear diminishes and disappears, and then my fear is over. When no spider is present, I have no actual fear. I, I still have a kind of um, uh, general understanding that I am a person who fears spiders, even if no spider is here. But then is, this is a general disposition in my personality. But I'm not actually afraid at any moment when no spiders are present. <clears throat> so <coughs> love then doesn't seem to work in this way. Love is not an emotion in the same way because it is more like a disposition. When I say that I love my child, I don't mean that at this moment I feel love for my child. I mean that I have a general condition, like I'm afraid of spiders. I don't mean that I necessarily actually feel the love for my child right now. So if we can distinguish between <clears throat> actual fear and the disposition to fear, then we must also see that love is more a disposition than an actual emotion. <clears throat> the second reason <coughs> is that there is no evaluation 
to distinguish love from other kinds of affect. All emotions involve an evaluation. You evaluate something as dangerous and therefore you are afraid. Evalu and, and the evaluation I make distinguishes which kind of emotion I fear. So fear and anger, for example, are similar. But they differ in the evaluations they involve. Anger involves having been wronged. Fear follows the judgment that something that one values is in danger. So when I see a spider, I will not be angry. I will be fearful. Because the evaluation is, the spider is dangerous to me. If I am wronged by someone, then I will feel angry, but not afraid, because nothing is in danger. Okay, And so the particular emotion, although it feels similar, fear and anger feel very similar. Uh, both times we have heart beating and we have you know high blood pressure and our face turns red or, or white or whatever. But um, the difference is the evaluation. In, in one case, it's... Uh, the evaluation is an evaluation that supports fear as a rational um, reply to this evaluation, uh, and the other time it supports anger. But then I can ask, you know, what is the evaluation of love? What, what is the evaluation to which the rational response would be love? And it's hard to find one, right? Except that the object is lovable. But if I say the object is lovable, then that is circular, right? I respond to the lovability of the object by loving the object. Uh, yeah, but, but then wh what does lovability mean? It means that I love the object. Yeah, then I have a circle, right? So this is a problem also. It's difficult to distinguish love from other emotions in this way because we don't know what the evaluation is. <coughs> <coughs> Now, of course, we don't need to agree with smarts here, right? If you think a little, we can come up with an argument um, <clears throat> saying that an object is lovable is not necessarily circular and uninformative. Is there, can you think of a way how you could plausibly judge what kinds of objects are lovable? <coughs> think of it for a moment. Stop the video. And... See if you can come up with a way to solve this problem. <clears throat> okay, so if you remember Wellman, based on Kant, you know, previously we talked about Kant, human beings have dignity, and this dignity is what motivates our love, uh, and our love is just a recognition of the dignity, and lovability is a contingent fit between me and somebody else's behavior based on the fundamental recognition of the other person's dignity. So in this way, we get a way to justify what is lovable without, at least without creating a circle. It's a question if this is useful for other reasons, right? Like we said, it's perhaps not personal enough or not selective enough, but we wouldn't create this particular circle. So in principle, we could imagine a condition of lovability that would justify saying that, um, like we saw on the previous slide here, we have an evaluation, right, that distinguishes love from other kinds of effect. And the evaluation is that there is a human being with his human dignity, and this is the reason to be lovable. Anyway, there are the two, there, there are three reasons. The last reason um, Smuts gives is emotions require that we care about something that will be affected. Emotions require that we care about something that will be affected. Emotions are based on concerns. They are evaluations of situations based on our concerns. When we care about something, we feel fear when it is threatened. We feel happiness when it is benefited. We feel angry when it is harmed and hopeful when it stands to benefit. <coughs> And all these are different emotions, <coughs> right? <coughs> when it's threatened, it's fear. When it's benefited, it's happiness. When it's harmed, it's angriness. When it uh, stands to benefit, with the prospect of benefit, it's hope. These are all different emotions. <coughs> but caring about something, about someone or something, loving someone, is kind of an umbrella emotion that causes all these specific emotions. 
are my love for X is the reason for the fear I feel when X is threatened. My love for X is the reason for the happiness that I feel when X is benefited, and so on. <clears throat> so my love is not like an emotion, like, like the others. My love is a separate thing. My love is the reason that justifies these other emotions. So my love is an overarching kind of umbrella thing from which all these different emotions come out and in which they find their justification. But then, what is the place of love? Um, we want to say that a mother's love for a child explains why she is angry when he is injured and fearful when he is threatened and happy when he does well. But then it, it shows that love is not in itself something like fear and anger and happiness. Love is the reason for the fear and anger and happiness. And therefore, it's of a different kind of, of thing. It's not an emotion like the others. It's a kind of meta-emotion, right? It's the principle of explanation behind the more specific emotions. It's the reason to have emotions, but not itself one of these emotions. Okay? So, conclusion, it doesn't seem like love is a normal emotion. Another way how emotion is different love is different from other emotions and and therefore you know we could make an argument that love is not an emotion is to think about the rationality or appropriateness of emotions some emotions we would say are rational some emotions are irrational and how do we judge whether an emotion is appropriate or whether an emotion is rational we say first an emotion has to be reasonable <laughs> it has to be fitting to the situation I will give examples later. Its intensity should be proportional to its object. It should be in our own long-term best interest. And it must be understandable. We must be able to understand why someone behaves that way. I, I can give examples of this, right? Again, you can take the fear of spiders. An emotion is to be reasonable. A fear of spiders is reasonable if I believe that the spider is dangerous to me. It has to fit the situation. I see a spider, I have the fear of spiders. If I don't see a spider and I have a fear, then something is wrong. Then I am, you know, hallucinating or something crazy. Its intensity should be proportional to the object. A small spider, I will not be much afraid. I will just... It's gone. A big spider will make me scream and run away. Right? The intensity is proportional to the object. It's in my long-term best interest to be afraid of spiders. Even if spiders are largely harmless, there might be one or two that I encounter in the course of my 70-year life which are dangerous, and therefore it's in my long-term best interest to go away from them. And, and certainly um, it doesn't harm me to avoid all other spiders too. It's, it's not like any spider will, will ever you know, benefit me uh, so that I'm missing something. It is in my long-term best interest to be afraid of spiders, even if most of the time this fear is not necessary, but it's never uh, a cause of harm to me. And it's understandable. You can understand why I'm afraid of spiders. They look ugly, they, you know, they, they, I'm afraid that they can bite me and so on. Do these now apply to love in the same way? Is love reasonable? <coughs> What is the reason for love? You know, then we start. What is the reason for love? If I have reasons for the, to love one person because of their yellow hair, what about other yellow-haired people? Do I love everyone? No, I love only the one. So it's not reasonable to love only this one. Does it fit the situation? Very often it doesn't, right? Romeo and Julia, these two don't fit the situation at all. The situation is totally opposed to their love. Uh, Wuthering Heights, you know, the, in uh, all romantic love, the, the whole point of romantic love is it doesn't fit the situation. Um, Abelard and Eloise, or, you know, whatever, uh, uh, Tristan and Isolde, it, it doesn't fit the situation. Love does not fit. Its intensity should be proportional to the object. Do I love, you know, my one girlfriend less because her hair is not that yellow? And the other was a much more yellow hair I love much more. And no, right? 
the intensity of love is not proportional to the object. Beautiful people or intelligent, brilliant, humorous people are not more loved by their lovers than people who are more plain and less, you know, sparkling. Um, everybody is loved by their boyfriends or girlfriends in, in roughly the same way. So the intensity of love is not proportional to the object. And particularly if you speak about agape, for example, um, my agape is not proportional to the lovability of the beggar. This would be crazy, right? If I loved the beggar uh, as much as the beggar appears to be lovable, uh, this would be very little love, right? Uh, I love the beggar uh, not because my love is proportional to the object to the to the loveliness of a beggar beggars are not lovely right we, we love them because of other reasons we love them because they're human beings and they have dignity and whatever you want to say right they are suffering and we, we empathize with them but it's not because of their loveliness so uh, the intensity is not proportional to the object in in, in any way uh, then then for example hitler should not have a girlfriend because the object is not lovable it should be in our own long-term best interest. Again, you can clearly see that this does not apply to love. Uh, it does not apply at all to romantic love, where uh, often being opposed to self-interest is the mark of proper romantic love, right? Abelard and Eloise don't, didn't you know, benefit from their love. Um, um, you know, Catherine and, and, and Heathcliff didn't benefit from from their love. Romeo and Julia didn't benefit from their love. It was not in their long-term best interest. Uh, all kinds of such uh, relationships are not in the best interest of the lovers. <clears throat> and finally, it's not understandable. But why does anybody love anybody else and, and do crazy things? And some people, you know, uh, would kill themselves for love uh, because they are, they, they feel so disappointed that the love is not returned or something. They, um, commit suicide. Uh, this is not in their long-term best interest and also it's not understandable often why they do it. Um, so all these, love is so irrational that it does n almost none of these things apply to love, although they apply very nicely to other emotions. So love therefore is not a normal rational emotion at all. Pismani Prince and another paper make roughly the same points but with slightly different observations so we should also have a look at that first love is not felt all the time it can be occurrent actually felt or dispositional being in love without feeling it all the time is the example we had before also about the fear of spiders Matt said the same thing love may be pleasant or unpleasant um Although most emotions, you know, are either pleasant or unpleasant, we have good emotions like feeling relaxed. We have uh, unpleasant emotions like fear and anger. Love is undecided. It's sometimes pleasant, sometimes unpleasant. I can be uh, in love, you know, in a way that I have these butterflies in my stomach and so on, and I feel light-hearted and positive about the world. Or I can depressed because be depressed because of love and anxious and so on. As a mental state, love is always directed towards a particular object. It is intentional. One is always in love with a particular person, not just generally in love. Right? This is okay. This is in. This is actually in um, agreement with what emotion should be. Right? Lovers tend to idealize the beloved. Love's occurrence or absence is not in our control. We cannot simply choose to stop loving. This is what Frankfurt also said. But it is opposed um, to what Matthew Liao says, for example. And <clears throat> now Pismani Prince discuss, you know, other basic features of emotions um, and try to see whether love could be an emotion. So emotions are reactions to experiences, right? This is also what we had with Smuts. Uh, my fear is a reaction to seeing a spider. Um, listening to a nice piece of music causes joy. As such, they're not directly under our control because they are triggered by the experience. Emotions feel in a particular way. Dispositional emotions must first be triggered to be felt. For example, my fear of spiders. 
And emotions have two objects. This is an important point you have to understand because you, later you will need it. Emotions have two objects. First, they have the target. It's the thing the emotion is directed at, the immediate target of my emotion, the spider, the wild dog. I'm attacked by wild dog, I have fear, and the target is the immediate target of my fear, is the immediate cause of my fear, is the dog. But then love has also a form, no, uh, sorry, emotions generally have also a formal object. The formal object, this is a misleading kind of designation, formal object, it's hard to understand what this is supposed to mean. It, now I explain it. It means the property that we fear in the target. So when you say, I fear the dog, this is the target, then you can ask, why do I fear the dog? What is it about the dog that I fear? And then you say, I fear that the dog can bite me. Uh, and the dog is dangerous because it can bite. And this is the formal object, is the dangerousness of the dog. Um, when I have an emotion like um, attraction to a sweet, attraction to a chocolate cookie, what is the target? The chocolate cookie. What is the formal object? The property that makes the cookie attractive, the sweetness of it, the taste of it, right? And emotions, therefore, are felt evaluations. The function of emotions is to track what matters to us, and this is the evaluation. It says this thing matters. Again, it's like Smart said the same thing, right? As evaluations, emotions can be correct or incorrect, rational or irrational. An emotion is justified if the formal object that it is picking out is actually provided by the target. Right? So I'm afraid of a wild dog and the formal object of my emotion is the dangerousness of the wild dog and my emotion is justified if the wild dog is actually dangerous. If the wild dog just wants to lick my hand, then my emotion of fear is not justified. The same with a cookie. The object of my desire the formal object is the sweetness of the cookie. If this cookie is not sweet, then uh, the formal emotion of my attraction to the cookie, the, the formal uh, object of my attraction to the cookie is, is not present, is not provided by the cookie, and therefore my emotion is inappropriate. <clears throat> right? Now, cognitive theories see emotions as beliefs or judgments, to be afraid of the dog means to believe that there is a dog present and that it is dangerous. So what about love? Can love be described as a cognitive state in the same way? Perhaps in love, one would believe that a particular person has certain properties and judge them to be lovable. But if this was the case, such property should always bring about the emotion of love. You know, when I talk about the dangerous of, uh, dangerousness of a dog, then every dangerous dog brings about the fear of, of dogs, of dangerous dogs. Uh, whether it's, you know, Pete the dog or um, Bully the dog, uh, doesn't matter because both Pete and Bully are dangerous dogs and if they come to bite me, I will run away from them because I'm afraid of the dog. But... This is not the same for love. If if I love, you know, particular properties in people and I love one person, then another person comes along, I'm not automatically going to love them too. So every spider will bring about the belief that the spider is dangerous and the desire to run away from it. But not every lovable person will bring about the emotion of love towards them. We are also often incapable of even saying what exactly the lovable properties should be. If you ask me what are the properties of my wife that make her lovable, it's hard to say, right? What exactly is it? I don't have a list of that, right? Love is not list-based in the same way. If the formal object, Pismeni Prince say, is grounded in the focal properties the beloved possesses, then, as with other emotions, the conditions that make a given emotion apt, apt means suitable, generalize over all cases for that emotion. 
So just as fear is always apt or justified in the presence of danger, so too it would seem love should always be apt in the presence of certain focal properties of the beloved. But it is not. Right? It is not. Now, another theory of emotions is famously William James. Uh, emotions are perceptions of the body. The body changes its state, and this change of state in the body is how the emotion subjectively feels to us, and this is what constitutes the emotion. So they would say the emotion is a kind of epiphenomenon, is a kind of uh, result of the bodily changes that are the primary source of the emotion. So they would say when I see a spider, my heart starts beating faster and my blood pressure goes up and I run away and all these, the inner feeling of all these bodily reactions is what I call my fear. This is my fear, right? Fear is a particular way of affecting the body, heartbeat, increased blood pressure, other biological effects. When we feel our body having these reactions, we call the resulting feeling fear. Now, could love be described in this way? Think about it for a second. Perhaps we can agree that fear has a particular way of being expressed in body states, but it does not seem that we can say the same about love. Because love seems to express itself in many different ways in the body. We can feel happiness or sadness or longing or sexual arousal and other bodily reactions that are all caused by love, and they all feel different. Sexual arousal doesn't feel at all like, you know, sadness. Uh, but both can be caused by love. Or happiness and sadness feel different. And, and often fear will feel just the same as love. If, if I'm afraid to lose my beloved or something, right? I can have a fear that feels like love. So love, even when romantic, can be felt in the absence of arousal. There can be cozy and endearing features of love, longing, feeling, feelings of fury. All these are manifestations of love. The problem is, last sentence here, that love has a variable phenomenology. Phenomenology means the way it appears to us. The way it feels from the inside is variable, is different. There is not a constant way how love should feel. Okay. Another way to describe emotions would be to say emotions are perceptions of value. Theories that view love as a response to the perceived value of the beloved. We have seen such theories already. For example, Wellermann says love is our response to other people's dignity. Singer sees love as caring value, creating value in the beloved through a process of bestowal, of caring, creating value in the beloved. But if love was an emotion, we should be able, when it is justified or rational, Theories that link love to values don't clearly specify what values would justify love. Love lacks reliable causes, right? You know, a spider is a reliable cause. My fear of the spider is a reliable cause for fear. Um, good weather, um, sitting on the beach is a reliable cause of happiness. But what is a reliable cause for love? A beautiful person, the, the campus is full of beautiful people. I don't feel love towards them, right? So where is the reliable cause for love? And so they try to say love is not an emotion. That's the conclusion from this, right? Love is not an emotion for all these reasons. Therefore, love is something else. And now they try to start to distinguish, you know. Perhaps they are... We can distinguish basic emotions, non-basic emotions, and sentiments, which would be a third kind of thing. And perhaps then love would be something else. So emotions are called basic when they are biologically prepared responses and they are not themselves made up of other emotions, right? Like with colors, perhaps you have to imagine colors. 
Um, we have the basic colors, right? Uh, red and uh, blue and yellow when you talk about pigments, or red and, red and green and blue when you talk about light pixels on a screen. And these are the primary colors, and then you have secondary colors that you get from mixing the primary colors. And if you have an emotion, and you have some emotions that are basic, and you have some emotions that are mixed emotions, right? Fear versus nostalgia. Fear exists in babies and animals, so it's biologically prepared. We are born with the capacity to experience fear, and our reaction to fear is biologically determined. Uh, when you have fear, you run away. This is biologically pre-programmed, and babies do it, and, and or you scream, you know, babies do it, uh, grown-ups do it, animals do it, everybody does it in the same way. Nostalgia, though, seems to be learned later in life. Animals don't have it, and we don't have a biologically pre-programmed response to it. So therefore, uh, it seems to be a secondary emotion. It's not a basic emotion. Basic emotions have their own typical facial expressions. Anger, disgust, fear, happiness, sadness, and surprise. They are the six things we will meet again later when we talk about robots, because this is an important thing with robot emotions. Anger, disgust, fear, happiness, sadness, and surprise. And uh, secondary emotions don't have this, right? Only the basic emotions. There is no facial expression for nostalgia, except looking, you know, pensive somehow. People from different cultures recognize the same emotion when shown a picture of a face with one of the basic emotions. So if you take a face showing, you know, anger to another culture, they will recognize this emotion. Right? Basic emotions also come with particular changes in the body, heartbeat, blood pressure, um, that trigger these automated responses. And they are not based on reasoning. These responses are not based on reasoning. For example, you cannot lose your fear of spiders by telling yourself that this spider is not dangerous. This doesn't work. It would be nice if it worked, but it doesn't. Uh, we cannot rationally um, decide not to be afraid of spiders. We can perhaps get used to spiders. There are therapies for spider phobias that involve, you know, looking at spiders for many hours and then touching them and so on until finally you are rid of your fear of spiders. But this is uh, a long-term process. It is not just a rational decision. Now I'm not afraid of spiders because I recognize that the spider is harmless. This does not help, right? Emotions are not controlled by rationality. Now, is love a basic emotion uh, on all these counts? You know, if you compare all these things, you would say um, love is common across cultures, but it doesn't seem to be basic. Among mammals, long-term exclusive bonding is rare. Most animals do not restrict sexual activity to one partner. Even in human beings, monogamy is relatively recent since the rise of agriculture it is not so common in nomadic cultures that you know travel around. Marriages were often not based on love. Romantic love only goes back to the 18th century. So therefore, these are arguments why love would not be a basic emotion because love is not biologically pre-programmed like fear is. Non-basic emotions are blends of basic emotions. Can you find some examples? What would be a non-basic emotion? Despair is a blend of fear and sadness, or, or perhaps hopelessness. Contempt may be a blend of anger and disgust. Right? Is love a combination then, perhaps, of lust and attachment? Can I say this? This would make it a non-basic emotion. <coughs> but again, this seems to be wrong. Right. Lust is characterized as sexual desire, which can be short-lived, can be satisfied, and the target is fungible. This is why pornography exists. It, it doesn't matter who the target of your lust is. You don't even need to know these people. It's just a photograph on a screen. But it is good enough for the purpose, right? So lust can be satisfied by looking at a photograph of a stranger. And this is why it's not the same as love. 
Romantic love is characterized as an obsessive, passionate state that has a normal shelf life of about 18 months to four years. Um, let's, you know, I don't know where they get the shelf life from, but um, it has a longer duration. Its targets are deemed to be non fungible. Right? Pornography, everybody who has the right, you know, bits on their body is okay. Uh, for love, not is not enough. Right. Attachment is characterized by a much more calm kind of state that can last one's lifetime. It is something that appears after romantic love comes into existence, provided that it succeeds in forming a relationship. All three of these can exist separately. So lust can exist separately. Uh, romantic love can exist separately of the other two. Attachment can exist separately. Um, without lust and without romantic love. It can be attached, for example, to my parents or my siblings, which is a kind of love that is lustless and romantic-less kind of love. Okay? And so the last category here are sentiments. Sentiments, they say, are dispositions towards things ways in which we tend to relate to things that are caused by repeated interactions with these things. So it's a kind of familiarity. Sentiments cause emotions. Thus, if you are hopeful, they say, that some end can be achieved, then you normally ought also to be afraid when its accomplishment is threatened. You should be relieved when the threat does not materialize. You should be angry at those who intentionally obstruct progress toward it and satisfied when you finally achieve it or disappointed when you fail. A disposition towards a thing that matters to me that is caused by repeated interactions with these things, this causes an emotion. Now, is love a sentiment or not? Sentiments seem too narrow. A sentiment is a disposition towards particular emotions, but love does not only cause emotions. Love also causes thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors. For example, the belief that the beloved is worthy of love, the behavior of wanting to be with the beloved, and so on. So if I say a sentiment is a disposition towards an emotion, then this does not cover love appropriately. Like emotions, sentiments are triggered by their target. They do not arise spontaneously. Sentiments are triggered. They do not arise spontaneously. Love, in contrast, is less reactive. We might be in love even without being in the presence of the beloved. I don't need my love to be triggered. I don't need to see my children in order to decide that I love my children. I can love my children without seeing them, um, without being in the presence of the beloved. It doesn't need to be triggered. But I cannot fear a spider without seeing a spider. Right? Okay. And so their solution is the following now. They say love is a syndrome. And what is a syndrome? A syndrome is an organized set of responses involving three things. Behavioral, physiological, and cognitive. Something happens, I have a response to it. My response is behavioral, behavior. Physiological, my body responds by the heartbeat, you know, changing or the blood pressure. And cognitive, my beliefs and my thoughts change. The love syndrome has several features. First, I idealize the loved one. This is a cognitive uh, response. Uh, it is a sudden onset, love at first sight. It has physiological arousal as part of it. It has the commitment and the willingness to make sacrifices for the loved one. This is a behavioral thing. Love is a syndrome, not a kind of feeling, but an intricate pattern of potential thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that tend to run together. And the word syndrome itself is Greek, right? It comes from syn, um, together. And the Romos, the way. So literally, syndrome means they're walking together along a way, they're traveling together. Companionship, 
right? Syndromes are often used to describe mental health conditions um, for, for, and other illnesses. For example, a common cold causes a set of responses, uh, bodily responses, fever, running nose, coughing, behavioral responses, inability to stand up for long periods, tendency to fall asleep, and cognitive responses, slowness in thinking, inability to concentrate, no desire to engage in sports. So this is a syndrome, the cold. The common cold is a syndrome because it causes these, um, it, it has these components, and these components together are what we call a common cold. These responses are different from person to person. Other responses are possible, and the ones mentioned might be absent. Right? There, there is some individuality, some variation in these responses. And syndromes are not rational responses. There's nothing rational about the inability to stand up for long periods, the tendency to fall asleep, or my slowness in thinking. Um, rationally, I shouldn't have these responses, but I do. They might be influenced by culture, but they're not created by a particular culture, right? So particular um, behaviors uh, might be, you know, different in different cultures. Um, ch childbirth, for example, or being pregnant uh, also has such components, right? Being pregnant has some biological components, it has some behavioral responses, it has some cognitive responses, but it is perceived differently in different parts of the world. Depending on society, pregnancy might be something more isolating, where um, the pregnant woman is put away, you know, uh, hiding somewhere in a, in a room, uh, or it might be something that is more more communal experience with other pregnant women, or it might be something that is more uh, medicalized, like in our society where we think that the proper place for a pregnant woman is a hospital. Um, so all these are different responses, culturally contingent responses to pregnancy, um, but they are not created by the culture, they are just you know, influenced by the culture, they are created by the pregnancy, these responses. Right? Syndromes don't need to have a formal object while emotions do, so while in a spider I need to be afraid of the dangerousness of the spider, uh, in the cold I don't need to be afraid of the coldness of the cold or something, uh, or to, to, to sneeze because I react to a formal object. Love does not need to be justifiable by reasons. The same is true of syndromes. Love is not associated with a particular bodily state. The same is true of syndromes. Love is not in it and not limited to brief episodes. Syndromes don't need to be either. Love is not a sentiment because it encompasses beliefs and behaviors as well as feelings, and this is also true of syndromes. So this is why love, according to Pismanian Prince, is a syndrome. Love is not a detector of properties. It is a way of being in the world, um, and it is a syndrome. Okay, so that's it for the moment. This was the, um, a, a too long again, treatment, but I hope that with this we can stop talking about that, of love as an emotion. Uh, love is not an emotion, surprisingly. Um, there are many reasons to believe that love is not an emotion, and um, you should remember what these reasons are, what arguments there are for me to say that love is an emotion or love is not an emotion, and next time we will talk more about um, other aspects of love. Okay, so let's stop here for a moment and see you in the next video.